introduce you and then you can get started. So first up today is Adrian. He earned his DVM in Costa Rica, uh, where he got some fish health experience working with Dr. Esteban Soto at UC Davis for a summer. Esteban recommended that he visit Mississippi State and work with Matt Griffin, where Adrian is now um, finishing a master's degree on Edward Ziella Pesticida. And he's gonna present on that topic here this right now. So take it away, Adrian. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Adrian Lopez Porras, and I'm going to talk about the interspecific variability of Edwardsella pesticida recovered from farm raised catfish and cross protected efficacy of a life attenuated Edwardsella ectolera vaccine. Uh, this work has been done with the help of Dr. Griffin, Dr. Weiss, Dr. Waldgeser, uh, Dr. Roser, and Dr. Suya. While well, farm-raised catfish is the largest U.S. aquaculture sector, and it accounts for around 70% of the total fin fish uh, production here in U.S. And this industry is mostly based in Alabama, Arkansas, and Mississippi. And just Mississippi accounts for around 56% uh, of the total acreage in U.S. dedicated to catfish culture. Um, hybrid catfish is the result of crossbreeding uh, between channel females and blue males, and it accounts for nearly 30% of the total U.S. acreage dedicated to this production. Um, channel calf, um, hybrid catfish uh, is getting more popularity among producers, and this is because they show uh, faster growth and better feed conversion rates. Uh, but it, they also show an improved um, disease resistance against the most common uh, diseases affecting uh, this industry, uh, like enteric septicemia of catfish um, caused by Edwardsella cholerae, columnaris disease, and proliferative gill disease. With this increase in hybrid production, there is also an increase in the number of hybrid cases submitted to the Aquatic Research and Diagnostic Laboratory here in Istanbul. And during the period comprehended from 2013 to 2017, around a half of these hybrid cases submitted to this laboratory accounted for hybrids. And almost 90% of those cases were diagnosed with Edorcella pisicida. Now, Piscine edwardsilosis is caused well by, by Edwardsilla pisicida, and it's been reported in more than 28 species, uh, fish species around the world. And the most uh, common grounds findings observed in affected fish are multifocal cutaneous pithication, ulcers, darkened skin, abdominal distension, and in more severe cases, uh, this lesion called hole in the head and also it's observed splenomegaly and renomegaly. And this disease in catfish affects mostly food-sized fish. Well, the first objective of my project was to determine interspecific variability of Edorcella pesticida isolates from Mississippi catfish aquaculture with an assessment of virulence in channels and hybrids. For this part of the study, we used 158 Edorcella pesticide isolates. Most of them uh, submitted to this diagnostic laboratory in Istanbul. Uh, for this, uh, as initial screening of these isolates, we used the red PCR. We used ERIC-1 and 2 primers. Now, given the sample size, it was quite large. Uh, we couldn't run all of them at once, so we had to split them into four different sets. And for each, uh, each set, we run this red PCR, uh, run the electrophoresis gel, and we analyze the banding patterns. And after that analysis, we got these different cladograms. And in each cladogram, we got different main clusters. So we selected from each main cluster uh, representative isolates, and in total we got 39. Uh, with these 39 isolates, we repeated that um, red PCR using ERIC-1 and 2 primers, 
And after the analysis, we got six different clusters. We also used uh, the box primers. And after the analysis, we got five different genetic clusters. And we did the same with uh, GTG5 primers. And again, we got uh, four different clusters. Now, uh, these clusters, um, using these different set of primers, they were not consistent. So we went for a different genotyping method. We used the multilocal sequence analysis. And for this analysis, uh, we used these three Gs, the GRB, PGI, and FOMU. Uh, we sequenced these three genes in these um, 39 isolates, and we also used um, sequences deposited in the NCBI database. Uh, we, after sequencing, we uh, concatenated them and did variation inference, and we got this different uh, phylogenetic tree. We got five main genetic clusters, and what was interesting is that all isolates from catfish, they were represented in all these different five uh, MLSA groups. And mostly they were placed into plates one, two, and four. And what, it, what was interesting too was that isolates from Asia, they were placed into uh, MLSA group three and just one isolate in MLSA clade um, five. With these isolates, we also uh, screened them for virulence related genes. We run around 26 different uh, PCRs, but these were the ones showing differences between them. Um, this color coded in the left column, it's for each MLSA group from Edorcelapisicide isolates. And some of these genes are related to type 6 creation system, CRISPR system, um, fibrial system, and also invasions. And they were uh, loosely associated with these MLSA uh, groups. We also screened these um, isolates for plasmids. And out of the 39 isolates, 17 were showing plasmids. And from these 17, five showed um, two plasmids. And with the help of Dr. Waldieser, we sequenced these isolates using nanopore sequencing technology. And we got 10 different plasmids showing a highly uh, variability in terms of this uh, characteristic. Now, there was no association between these plasmids and these um, Edward Silapisicida MLSA clades. Now, we wanted to evaluate um, virulence in these Adrocella um, pesticide MLSA groups. We did uh, two infectivity trials, and for each trial, we selected two different isolates as representatives of each MLSA group. Uh, each MLSA group uh, was a treatment, and each treatment had five replicates. And for each replicate, we had 20 fish. So we challenged them by IP injection and uh, recorded mortality for uh, 15 days. And after this period, uh, cumulative mortality was much higher in hybrids, uh, which corroborates previous studies showing that Dorsilipisicida is more vital in, in hybrids than in channels. Now, uh, this cumulative mortality per uh, treatment, in all them, uh, mortality was higher in hybrids than in channels. We didn't find any uh, difference between these treatments in hybrids, but in channels, MLSA5 group showed to be more virulent than the other. Now, with this said, uh, the second objective of my uh, research project was the evaluation of cross-protective efficacy of a live attenuated Edorcilla Telluride vaccine against heterologous Edorcilla pesticide isolates in channels and hybrids. The group that I've been working with, they developed uh, an, an, a live attenuated Edorcilla Telluride vaccine to protect channel catfish against 
enteric septicemia of cartridge, which is caused by Edwardsilac telluride. And recently, the same group uh, showed that this vaccine also protects uh, channels and hybrids against Edwardsiella piscicida by cross protection. Now, in this study, they just used one isolate of Edwardsiella piscicida, and it showed a high um, RPS. So, with the establishment of these new um, and different MLSA Edwardsiella piscicida clades, we wanted to know if that vaccine uh, protects against all these different uh, clades. So for this study, what we did is we had uh, channels and hybrids, and each one was, um, each one, each group had uh, vaccinated and non-vaccinated. And for each of them, we held different, six different treatments plus controls. And each treatment consisted of each MLSA group. And what we did is we vaccinated just, uh, well, vaccinated groups and by immersion. And after 30 days, we challenged each treatment with the respective MLSA group, isolate. And this was done uh, by IP injection, and then we recorded mortality. So RPS from this uh, trial uh, were ranging from 54 to 77 in hybrids. And in channels, the RPS were ranging from 80 to 100% in channels. So this is a summary of the survival. Um, in vaccinated hybrids, this survival uh, was much higher than non-vaccinated, showing that this vaccine protects against th these different Edwardsella piscicida isolates. And the same happened with channels. Now, this survival um, and this uh, cross-protective uh, efficacy was shown to be higher in channels than in hybrids. And part of this is because hybrids are more susceptible to Edwardsella piscicida than channels. Now, uh, we wanted, well, we did like uh, an inverse or conversely way this. Uh, for this uh, trial, uh, we held, again, channels and hybrids. We had six different treatments, each one corresponding to each MLSA group. And we exposed by immersion each of these treatments to each of these um, different Edwardsiella piscicida MLSA clades. And after 30 days, we challenged them with Edwardsiella telluride wild type and by immersion. And what we got were that this um, immunization with this different Edwardsiella piscicida uh, was very important. And RPS in hybrids were ranging from 25 to 43. And in channels, uh, these RPS were ranging from 18 to 33. And this uh, immunization showed to be very important in both groups, hybrids and channels. And we can see that uh, non-exposed uh, fish, they almost died around, um, all of them died uh, at day five or seven. And here uh, we can see that this protection was quite higher in the hybrids than channels. Uh, but this, um, this number is very close. So we, that's something that we want to repeat. But what is important here is that uh, there was a cross protection in both directions, in both groups. Well, as uh, conclusions for this work is that there are at least five different uh, Edwardsiella piscicida clades in catfish aquaculture. And we found there was an association between some virulence genes and uh, these MLSA clades. And this work also supports previous uh, works showing that Edwardsiella piscicida is more virulent in hybrids than in channels. And also, that what I think is the uh, most important point uh, and conclusion from this work is that this life attenuated Edwardsilla vaccine protects channels and hybrids against all these Edwardsilla piscicida clades.
So I want to thank to uh, my committee members, Dr. Matt Griffin, Dr. Weiss, uh, Dr. Suja, Dr. Roser, and also I want to thank to um, technical assistance from people uh, from this place. And our financial support uh, was from uh, Mississippi Agriculture and Forestry Experiment Station, uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine here from Mississippi, and also MAFIS and the USDA. Thanks. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. If anybody has those, you could go ahead and unmute yourself and ask or send it to me directly in the chat and I can read that to Adrian. Adrian, yeah. excellent work. Um, I, I do Thanks. have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one, um, um, the first one is is here, and, and and I think like it might be a little bit complicated of a question. So let me try to go slowly with it. So when you vaccinate catfish, okay, um, you will vaccinate in theory with this ESC live attenuated vaccine. You know, either the hybrids or the channels. Once you vaccinate them, what will be the first? of the potential Edward Cielas that the fish will be um, susceptible to as some of them come, you know, more uh, prevalent at different times of the year, right? You know, ESC mainly in the spring and then in the, in the fall. Um, and, and, uh, and the Edward Ciela piscicida, which is like my second point of the question is, uh, do you see it year round? or you also see it, you know, more in the summer or in the fall or in the spring, you know. Uh, but basically my question is more in, uh, in terms of, uh, if you go ahead and vaccinate, you know, the fish, um, I'm, I'm assuming with this immersion vaccine, you know, your goal is to vaccinate as early as possible and then, uh, you know, move the fish, you know, into the ponds. When is it that you expect, you know, the fish post-vaccination to be exposed to the first pathogen being, you know, again, Edward Ciela, Ictaluri, or Piscicida. And uh, basically, have you considered, you know, once they are exposed to this first pathogen, if that will actually serve almost as a boost for when the second pathogen comes around. So if you vaccinate with uh, the ESC vaccine, and then um, you see the fish sees either Edward Sierra Piscicida or Ictaluri. Whenever the second wave of uh, pathogen exposure comes, do you expect you know, some sort of boost so that you don't have to, you know, basically you just have to vaccinate once? Yeah, well, uh, this, um, they, use, they have been using this vaccine um, you know, like uh, 40 or 50 days after um, uh, hatching. And it's uh, during mostly when the summer starts at the end of the spring. And most of those cases are during the summer and early fall. So we expect that this protection, uh, you know, cause we evaluated them uh, 30 days. So we are talking about um, adapted immune response so we are assuming that this protection is going to be is going to last for uh, that period of time, and that could be that's a good possibility. Uh, they have seen that with one vaccination uh, induces enough protection against all these uh, different Rosella pesticide isolates, and one vaccination is enough. But as you said, this exposure to these different environmental um, isolates could could induce uh, a boost, but that's something that so far uh, hasn't been um, at least done. So the piscicida, like the piscicida infections, you see it year round, or you see it mainly at a you know specific um, you know at, at some seasons you know in, in Mississippi. Is it more of a spring, fall, summer, winter? Yeah, it's mostly, mostly during the summer, when the, at the end of the spring, you can see uh, some cases, but it's mostly during the summer when the temperatures start to increase. And then you can see also some cases uh, during the early fall. Okay, 
so so that 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 comes up like you know to my question because if you guys have already been vaccinated with the ESC vaccine for for quite some time, I think this vaccine has been used you know for more than a year. So and and because of the life cycle of the of the catfish, I'm not sure the hybrid how fast you know to market you guys have it. But if it lasts you know more than a year, then potentially that you know the year old catfish will be exposed again to piscicida, you know, in the second spring of their life. So have you seen also, like, because piscicida can affect, again, more of the adults, right? So yeah. have, you, have you seen protection at that second potential round with um, vaccinated animals? Well, at least I, I haven't. Uh, I work with... Uh, just fingerlings, you know, like a first step uh, for this project. But yeah, that's something that uh, we need to look at because as you said, uh, this protection, you know, they are um, vaccinated very early during the production cycle, but I don't know about that stage and that's something that uh, definitely has to be done. But well, people from here, they have seen that, uh, you know, correlation with antibodies I heard titers of antibodies and vaccinated fish can last um, for around six months, I think. Yeah, no, that will be interesting because again, as, as you were saying, you know, that, uh, that adaptive immune response, you know, could potentially get primed. So if it gets primed again in the fall, if they see Edward C. like Talure again, you know, then that could be potentially enough to prime them against the next time that they see, you know, the piscicida. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 is a great great job. Yeah. I have a question. If someone else doesn't, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi, um, hi, Adrian. This is Gail Kiras. I'm out in Seattle. Uh, beautiful talk. Really enjoyed it, and I love the seminar series. My question for you has to do with what we know about. Well, I don't know anything about it. What you know about the live attenuated vaccine infectivity? Uh, how in, how much is it infectious, and is that vaccine by itself is there onward transmission of the vaccine strain in vaccinated fish? Do we know much about the actual infection, not just the protection? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a very good question. As I would say, as all the live attenuated vaccines, there is also a chance that they can infect and cause disease in fish. Now, um, with that said, uh, depending on the conditions, if, cause we have seen this and that happened in, in my study, um, unfortunately, when fish get stressed, uh, for, for many reasons, or like uh, quality, water quality is not uh, very good. This, this can uh, predispose fish uh, to get sick by the vaccine. Now that's, um, that usually happens, but that for sure is, um, is a possibility. Yeah, um, the reason I ask has to do with evolution of the virus, obviously, from the attenuated strain. And that still doesn't make that more compelling than the protection it causes. I'm not suggesting you, you, know, you wouldn't use it, but it's something that we need to understand as much as possible. Well, uh, well, I, I would say like, um, it's, it's not like general rule, but there, there is like a range and you have to play with that again, not just for uh, life attenuated vaccines. They could have, this could happen with basically uh, every vaccine, but um, when you uh, vaccinate fish or every, you know, like any other animal, uh, you need to get, when you vaccinate them, they have to be in a good shape. You know, they have to be in a healthy way. Uh, so that way the vaccinated, the vaccine, the attenuated vaccine uh, will induce uh, an infection, but this infection will not uh, induce disease. What is happening is that the immune system, which is in good shape, will be able to control this um, infection and 
um, induce uh, cross presentation or presentation of the antigens. But in sick fish or stressed fish, which are not able or they don't have a good immune system for that, they definitely will be sick and affected by these live attenuated uh, vaccines. Not just with this one, but uh, this can happen with any other um, attenuated vaccine. Yeah, I'm not so much thinking of what happens to the animal you vaccinate as what happens to the pathogen or, or to the attenuated vaccine strain if it's transmitted through several rounds and it could evolve and, and change. Um, it's, well, uh, but that's, it, that's just something to consider. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, it's very interesting that the genome of Edrosilectaluri is very stable. And it's very interesting that the genome of Edrosilla piscicida is, uh, is very different. Uh, it has, uh, its plasticity is very high compared with Edrosilla ectoluri. So, and that was shown with, you know, carrying the different plasmid, uh, different viral lens genes. And, but yeah, I mean, that can happen with what we have seen with this, at least with this uh, pathogen, uh, looks like this genome is highly stable. Great, thanks, very nice. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, uh, if you have time. If we have one minute. Uh, okay, so be quick. I'm not gonna take as much time as Esteban. Uh, this is Haitham from uh, University of Wisconsin. So we know, uh, and, and nice talk by the way, Adrian, uh, very good job. Uh, we know that ingestion is the main route of infection of ESC. And uh, I've seen that you did most of your challenges by IB injection. Uh, have you seen a difference between IB injection versus immersion uh, challenges? Uh, well, that's a very good question. The reason why we have been using IP injection with EPCSIDA is because uh, by immersion, they don't induce, um, it doesn't induce disease. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's the way, that's the best model for uh, this infection. Now, um, we could think that this vaccine, because it's IP injection, you know, there is a compartmentalization, and we can think that this uh, protection, because the vaccine is uh, delivered by immersion, so there is a protection induced uh, systemically. Mm -hmm. Now, with the second uh, trial, we used uh, both the immunization and then the challenge was by immersion, and there was uh, some sort of protection. So. Uh, we can think that definitely that protection is been happening at the mucosal levels, but unfortunately, that's something that we cannot evaluate uh, so far. Okay, thanks. Good job. All right, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, we appreciate your presentation. It was very well done. Um, thanks a lot. If you could stop.